Uh, kia ora tato, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. So, um, uh, this uh, presentation workshop uh, is about a little tool called the Message House, which, uh, as a uh, communications professional, uh, I have found this the most useful tool that I've um, ever um, experienced. Um, so, I imagine uh, you've all had this situation, you, you've maybe created this situation um, where you're looking to communicate something. Uh, and somebody has to put, put together um, a set of messages. Uh, uh, I sort of uh, have experienced this regularly and still do experience it at MPI, despite the fact that I'm um, actively sort of proselytising around this tool. Um, and the set of messages just comes to you and it's um, two sides of A4 bullet points, um, which is not really a set of messages, it's a story or it's an argument, but it's certainly not a set of messages. So what this tool is really useful for is helping people to kind of um, understand a what is a message and um, develop a message and to organize a message and then to deliver a message and it's a really useful tool um, for you know most forms of communication that you could think of so it's fantastic um, for um, uh, preparing a media release it's fantastic for preparing somebody to engage in a media interview it's a fantastic way for thinking about how to organize a speech going to give a presentation to SLT or to a group of stakeholders or to a community group it's just really ubiquitously useful um, so look I encourage you to get get familiar with it and and give it a crack um, it's also um, beautifully simple okay so that's a really good thing about it so can we um, Click to the first, next slide. So should I just do this when I want you to click? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Okay, so um, this is a useful way to start off. So this is um, uh, researched uh, uh, and it's about the way that people receive information. So what it, that, what it says that 70% um, of the information that people receive, which you know, affects the, the, uh, what they believe, the opinions they establish, um, is visual, so it's based on oral cues. So sorry, on, on visual cues. So um, you know, when I came and stood up here, when you saw me in this room for the first time, you started making judgments about me, right? Of course you did. So that little voice at the back of your head saying, "Oh, he's bald, he's old, he's white," um, <laughs> you're, you're making judgments about me, and it's okay because I've been making them about you guys as well. Um, it's it's human nature, and it's it's the thing that really drives what we think about people and what people are saying, right? Um, so, you know, I sit in front of television news most days and I, I, I kind of listen to the news and then I see this person come up and I say, oh, I can't believe he's wearing that. Um, so I'm making a judgment about him and I'm not hearing the words. Um, so that's part of the way I'm responding to that situation. It makes up 70% of, of how we receive information. 18% of it is oral. So. Um, it's the tone of your voice, whether it's warm or cold, the, 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 the rate at which you speak, the accent you have, um, the, the, uh, the timbre of your voice, and only 12% of it is verbal, i.e. the words that we're using. Um, so you, know, you could say, well, bugger me, I don't really need to worry about this messaging thing very much, right? Um, uh, or you could say that that means that the form of the messaging that I'm developing is really, really important and I have to craft it because I've only got that little gap to get it through. Um, uh, and certainly at the end of the day, in my world, um, despite the 70 and the 18 per cent, the words are the things that are most important because they're the things that we actually say and we get hung on them if they're wrong. Um, so that's why the message is absolutely critical to what we're com communicating. Um, so, uh, what's a message? Uh, messages are the things you have to tell people to change their opinion, feelings or behaviour. Um, really simple. Um, they're the specific things that we're telling people to change their feelings, their op opinions or their behaviour. Um, so, uh, in my previous uh, life uh, running a communications consultancy, I spent an awful lot of time media training people. And I would always say to them, why are you doing this? And they would say, because my company's telling me to do this. Um, nobody enjoys it. Um, but actually what they're doing it for, and the reason we're communicating, we're doing it for a purpose, right? We're not doing it just for the sake of communicating, just for the sake of standing up in front of an audience or a television camera. 
Um, we're doing it because we want to achieve an outcome. Um, and that outcome is about the way that people um, think, feel or do uh, in relation to the, what we're telling them. Are we allowed to ask questions? Sure. Or at so the end might be better. I saw that slide, sorry, Sue Alice, Sue Hi, Sue. the Haemophilia Foundation. As soon as I saw that message there, yeah. I thought, well, I don't totally agree with that because messages for us is about informing. Yeah. Informing our members, yeah. not necessarily wanting to yeah. change their opinion or their yeah. feelings or their behaviour, but just to let them know. Yep. And why, do you, why is it important for you to let your members know something? Sorry? Why is it important that they should know the thing you're communicating about? Why is it important yeah. to inform? Yeah. Because we are required to. Yeah. So, so, you, so you want them to understand that you're fulfilling your, your obligations to them. And so therefore the way that you do that and the way you write that is, is important. So, that, so you're so informing well. As an example, if I give my um, CEO annual report, it's really just about what I've been doing for the year and thanking people. I'm not wanting to change their behaviour or their feelings. Well, well, you are because you're thanking them. So you, you, when you're thanking them, you're wanting an emotional response from them. I think whenever we're communicating, we're, we're eliciting a response, right? Or we ought to be eliciting a response. We need to understand what that response ought to be, um, and drive our content toward that. Yeah, so I reckon. So anyway, that's what I think a message is. Um, I think this is also really important when thinking about a, a, a message. So messages should be emotional um, and rational, and they should be a combination of both. So um, if you've ever done sales training, uh, you'll be told that most people buy on, on um, emotion. They, they don't make rational decisions. And so um, when uh, you went and brought those boots, you would have gone into the shop and you would have thought, they look really good and I'm going to feel good in those. And you tried them on and you felt good in them. And then you said, oh, and they're on sale, so there's 20% off and they're you know, really good leather and really good soles. So you kind of make that emotional purchase first and then people, most people sort of ra post-rationalise purchasing decisions. Um, and it's kind of the same when you're communicating. So you know, if you can talk to people's hearts, um, uh, you, you're probably going to get further than just kind of arguing with their grey matter. Um, but always getting a combination of emotional and rational messages working together is, is really helpful and really important. When you work in a government department, um, you spend most of your time figuring out things sort of from a rational perspective and arguing stuff really rationally. And I got this fact, this fact, this fact, and this fact, which says that you're wrong. Um, uh, and um, that's kind of important, um, but we forget that people are people. Um, and you've got to communicate on that level as well. So that's what we're really trying to... Have we lost that slide? Oh, so, <laughs> uh, so this is the rational and the emotional. So um, rational messages use facts to persuade. They talk to people's heads. Uh, emotional messages use feelings to motivate. They talk to the heart. And a combination of the two is ideal. Okay. So this is it. This is the message house. Um, uh, uh, really simple framework, and um, you know you ought, you ought to, and you can pretty much write your um, entire um, uh, messaging framework within this thing called a message house. So we'll just run through it. It's really, really simple. Um, what's our next slide? Okay. So at the top of the house is your key message. Um, so in this model, you have one key message, and it is the most important thing that you have to say to the people you're communicating with, to your audience. Um, so if I've only got an opportunity to what, say one thing, what is it? And you think about that, um, that 12%, you know, maybe you only have got a chance to say one thing or two things. You need to know what the most important thing is. Um, it's the thing that you want them to take away. It's the thing that you want them to remember. So that's your key message. Then um, underneath your key message, you have a range of uh, call messages. Um, three is a good number. Um, I like odd numbers more than even numbers. Um, four is maybe okay. Um, but you remember when you're um, in any form of communication, except when you're really listening attentively to um, a, um, 
uh, mid-50s bald white guy, um, you might take in a lot more. But in most forms of communication, people actually don't have much space in their brains to take things in, right? Um, so what we're trying to do is hone things down to a small number of um, key takeaways. And so these core messages support the roof of the house. They're the pillars, okay? Um, they're things that add depth. And then at the base of the house, you have the base. Um, and it's where all your evidence and your proof um, and your anecdotes uh, reside. Um, but, and it's really important because it's what everything sits on. So it's fundamentally important. But when you're communicating, it's actually the least important thing, stuff for you to communicate. Um, so I use this model a lot um, I have used this model a lot uh, for media training and uh, what I say to people is that you need to understand that key message and that is the only thing you have to deliver in your interview and if you can deliver that as an answer to your first question and if you can deliver that once or twice more during the interview then you have done your job don't worry about everything else just that one thing if you've got an opportunity to layer it with those core messages that would be great as well and then if you want to pack it out with some evidence and data, that'd be great as well. But number one job is that key message and you need to deliver it. And if you at all can, deliver, deliver it as your answer to your first question. Uh, and the way to do that is just to say it regardless of the question. <laughs> can you hear that? And you hear that, yeah. It's just, it's just the way to do it. Um, so, so most important thing is how do you write your message house? Um, so the way you do it is you start off with those core messages and those core messages um, should answer some really basic questions about the thing that you're communicating and so this is the real trick of the message house. You've got to figure out your questions but normally they're really simple questions. Uh, some, the questions like what is it, why is it needed, why is it unique, how is it different, um, what change will it make. Um, uh, in Sue's case, what impression do I need to create? Um, so if you, aren't, if you can answer those, if you can figure out what those questions are, maybe what the most important three or four questions are about the way that you're communicating, if you can answer those in one short, simple sentence, then you have your three or four core messages. It's as simple as that. And there's a, so can we just go back to that one? There's a, there's a really good way to do that. Um, more brains is always better than one. Um, and so if you can get six people as ideal in a room, um, get a, three pieces of butcher's paper, write the questions up on, on the top of that paper, um, get one group to answer that question, one group to answer the next question, one group to answer the next question, give them five minutes doing that, then rotate around. Um, and don't get the next group to do another answer, get them to improve that answer, okay? unless the answer is totally stupid. Um, but if you can, get them to improve the answer, because this, this is about our craft as communicators. So um, can we sharpen it up? Can we make it more impactful? Can we make it more emotional? Um, and so that's a really simple form of brainstorm that can honestly get you your core messages in about 15 minutes. Um, uh, and the more you kind of do it like this, the better it works. Yeah, what do we got next? Oh, sorry. Um, can we just go back to that last one? I've jumped ahead of myself. Um, so um, th that's how you get your core message, and then your key message. So this is the this is a little bit trickier. Your key message should, in some way, um, stem from those core messages. It should, in some way, kind of summarise that core message. Uh, but again, you, you ought to be able to do that quite quickly. Um, and then you spend an awful lot of time working on the base. The stuff that is, is really important, but it's not the most important stuff to communicate. And I'll tell you a little bit about why it's really important. Um, so that's the message house in a nutshell. It's really simple. Um, I've got some examples to show you. Um, so can we go to the next one? Thank you. So um, uh, in 2000 and... 
2014, I think it was, October 2014, uh, the chief executives of uh, Fonterra and Federated Farmers received a letter in, in, in the mail. And the letter said that unless New Zealand stops using 1080, um, we are going to contaminate uh, by March 2015, we are going to contaminate um, infant baby formula um, and we're going to put it on the shelves in New Zealand and in an overseas country. Um, so that's quite a serious threat, right? Killing babies is quite a serious threat. So um, uh, um, in m March 2015, um, after uh, months of work kind of trying to understand this and the implication of this, what we would do about it and how we would communicate it, um, uh, MPI and the rest of government pretty much went out and we told New Zealand and the world about this threat. And um, it was, uh, the, the, the project name was called Operation Concord. Um, and this was our message house for Operation Concord. Um, our key message was that infant formula is as safe today as it was before the threat was made. Uh, and to substantiate that, we've said the safety and well-being of consumers is our number one priority. Um, as always, parents and caregivers should check packaging for signs of tampering. If you've got something that could help the investigation, contact the police. So I can't remember what it, exactly what questions we were, we were asking, but I suspect um, the first question was um, probably what are we doing about it? The second question might have been, what do we want parents to do about it? And the third question was, what do we want the public to do about it? So that's probably how we came up with that message house, sort of thinking backwards. Um, and then we kind of summarised all of that to say that infant formula uh, is as safe today as it was before the threat was made. Um, when you've got uh, an unknown actor um, threatening to um, poison babies uh, through the use of infant formula, that's a really significant statement to make. But we were able to make that hand on heart, totally confident, um, uh, because of a massive amount of work that we had done to basically delimit the threat and to remove the threat from New Zealand. And all of that work that we had done um, existed in that bottom pile, in the base. Um, uh, so we could stand up and we could confidently deliver all of those messages and if probed and asked and challenged about it, we had answers for them and those answers res resided in the base. But they weren't the most important things for us to say. The most important thing for us to say was that infant formula is as safe today as it was before the threat was made. And the reason we wanted to say that, two, two key reasons we wanted to say that, uh, one was that um, Parents need to feed their children, and some parents can't feed their children breast milk. They need to be able to use infant formula. And we needed for them to have confidence uh, in what they were feeding their children. And the other thing we needed to say that was because we wanted to keep both um, p people in our country calm and our international markets calm, because this was a threat. Uh, number one threat was to children. Number two threat was to our trade in infant formula. So that's how that message house framework worked in that circumstance. So, next slide. Um, so uh, here's a really good checklist. Um, messages should be compelling. They should, uh, to my first point, encourage action or encourage an attitude or a belief or something like that. So they should drive people from what you want them to think, do and believe now to what you want to, them to think, do and believe in the future. And so you can see that in that Operation Concord Message House. Um, they should be differentiating. So probably particularly if you're a commercial organisation and you're selling shampoo, it's really useful to be able to you know, find a way to differentiate your product from everybody else's product, which is probably exactly the same but has a different name and different coloured um, packaging. Um, they should be relevant to 
the audience that's receiving the message, and that's, that's, that's really important in terms of the craft, right? So the language should be relevant to that audience in particular. The types of words that you might be using to a scientific audience about the same topic might be different to the types of words that you'd be using to a lay audience about the same topic. Um, they should st st uh, strike the right tone of voice. Um, they should be credible. So I'll give you an example of this, a recent example of my work. Um, uh, you know, uh, as a country, we have this big challenge um, protecting uh, Maui and Hector's dolphin. Uh, they're you know, really, really threatened, right? And um, one of the big impacts on them is um, fishing, both commercial and recreational fishing. Uh, in recent times, um, it, uh, another threat has emerged, and it's uh, toxoplasmosis um, from cats. Uh, and you go out and you say, oh, well, the biggest threat to Maui's and Hector's dolphin is toxoplasmosis from cats. And people go, what the, how does that work? And they just don't believe you, okay? Um, uh, because it sounds so implausible how a you know, cat pooing on a garden wades down can kill a Hector's or Maui's dolphin. Um, uh, so when you're communicating that sort of kind of slightly shocking news or challenging news to most people, you've got to think of a way to formulate that and to message that. So that's what um, uh, that's what credible is about. Um, and th the, the first time um, sort of this challenge became public, I happened to be sitting uh, in a room um, on a completely different subject for a day with uh, a senior person from an NGO who uh, all day uh, she kept needling me that um, you're just saying this because you wanted to protect the commercial fishing interests. So that's why, you know, being, and that's entirely not right, but that's why ensuring that your messages are credible is important. And so it's again, it's about the way that you craft them and the way you substantiate them. Um, they should be defendable. Uh, so is what you're saying true? Um, it has to be true. Always it has to be true. It uh, doesn't matter, you know, how cleverly you write them. Fundamentally, they have to be true. Um, and will they last? So if I'm saying this thing today, um, is it going to be true? Is it going to be a useful message to deliver tomorrow or next week or next month? So these are, these are good things to think about once you've crafted your messaging. Um, so can we go to the next one? So just here's a, here's a couple of options for the way that you might end up writing a message house. Um, uh, so you can use the framework and you can you know write everything in the framework but those kind of angular lines and you know narrow spaces can make that difficult so you can, you can just turn it into a word document and that's this is sort of one way we do it at my work um, so your key message is number one three supporting messages and um, the beginning of your detailed talking points um, then very last slide so um, in my work, I've tried to instill this in the organisation um, and uh, in my former comms team. And you know, some some people have sort of grasped it and they've they've run with it. Um, uh, others sort of revert back to um, other methods and um, historical practices. Um, so I haven't been entirely successful in inculcating it. But what we have done is on our and so this is, this is actually really quite useful on our intranet. We have a page for message houses uh, and every message house we write goes onto that page and people anybody from the organization if they want to know about glyphosate and infant uh, glyphosate and milk or whatever they can go to that page and they can find that messaging and if they want to go out and use that with whoever they're talking to they're most welcome to do that um, so that's what that's one of the things that we do with it and you can see on the right hand side there we're writing them mostly using the house model, but I, I prefer the word document myself. That's just me. Um, so one last reminder um, around emotional and rational. The emotional tail wags the rational dog. Um, we are all emotional beasts. Yep. All right, that's me.